Senate Banking, Housing, Urban Affairs Committee will come to order. I will uh, make two sort of personal statements. One is um, I was cheering on the University of South Carolina Gamecocks in that game, even though they were down 13 to 2 at the beginning, and, and Senator Scott's team won. Go and, Cox. And more interesting, no offense to them, was or to Senator Scott, but I, yesterday I, I missed, I rarely miss a vote. I missed a vote because my wife and I sat on our, on our back porch and saw the total eclipse in Cleveland. It went over Cleveland, the center of the world. Um, during, <laughs> and it actually passed over NASA, one of the 10 NASA facilities. And it certainly it was, just was on Sunday the center of the basketball world. And the so game, this, is true. The, this final four women's were in Cleveland. Indeed, for a good reason. The Gamecocks play well in South Carolina, Ohio, California. <laughs> they just play well everywhere. But okay, your no time has expired, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to be, be the chairman. <laughs> oh, how much time you got, man? It's a long, long wait. <laughs> we'll see. Do I have to call it to order again? I did that, right? Um, thank you. Uh, nice to see you, Mr. William. We'll introduce you in a moment. We face threats to American national security and global stability every day. Autocrats, terrorists, drug traffickers work to undermine our economy, our values, our way of life. Sophisticated international cartels traffic fentanyl into our communities. China supplies precursor chemicals to Mexican cartels, feeding our deadly fentanyl epidemic. Russia's brutal invasion of Ukraine continues. Putin looks for new ways to fund his war machine. Iran finances terrorist proxies that wreak havoc all over the Middle East from Hamas's brutal October 7th attack on Israel to the Houthi attacks on shipping in the Red Sea and Hezbollah's menacing activity. All these bad actors need one thing, money. Terrorists, fentanyl traffickers, the Russian military, they all need to spend and to move money. They all use the financial system in a variety of ways to do that. That's we must, why we must use all available economic tools to defend American interests and American values. It means denying bad actors access to the global financial system and broadening our coalition of partners to prevent terrorism and the flow of illicit finance that supports drug traffickers and money launderers. Terrorists, criminals, rogue nations will never stop in their efforts to evade our sanctions regime. We must be equally vigilant. Vigilance requires that our national security leaders have the authorities and the resources they need to stay ahead of these bad actors. Today we'll hear from Deputy Treasury Secretary Adeyemo and discuss our strategy for combating illicit finance. Treasury leads the work to stop illicit actors from exploiting the international financial systems to fund their crimes and terror activity. Deputy Secretary Adeyemo should provide an assessment of the effectiveness of our recent sanctions enforcement efforts. We'll hear about what statutory gaps stand in the way of our ability to root out and stop illicit finance. Congress must respond. Last year, this committee worked together in a bipartisan way to design a new sanctions program, the Fend Off Fentanyl Act, that can help reduce the flow of fentanyl into our communities. Fend Off Fentanyl has 67 co-sponsors. It passed out of this committee unanimously. I thank Senator Scott and the other members of this committee. It passed in the Senate twice. Americans can't wait any longer. This needs to get to the president's desk and be signed into law. As Fend makes clear, our committee plays a critical role in protecting communities and protecting our national security. This committee works to strengthen tools we have to go after anyone who threatens us it conducts oversight over how the administration uses these tools, including their use of waivers or exceptions. And when bad actors turn to new routes to raise and move money, like crypto, this committee must respond. Our adversaries are going to innovate. We must make sure our illicit finance tools keep up. Last November, the Justice Department, in an effort led by the U.S. Attorney in the Northern District of Ohio, where I live, and the DEA charged 11 people in a drug ring. They allegedly trafficked fentanyl, synthetic opioids, and other drugs across Ohio, Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Tennessee, and they paid their suppliers in Bitcoin. Just last week, the Wall Street Journal reported how Russian smugglers used the stablecoin Tether to evade sanctions on Russia's war machine. Tether's a 
quote, key step in the chain, unquote, of illicit transactions, one smuggler said. North Korea has hacked, stolen, laundered hundreds of millions of dollars in crypto, a strategy to avoid sanctions. And these, all these bad actors, North Korea, Russia, terrorist groups like Hamas, aren't turning to crypto because they've seen the ads and bought the hype. They're using it because they know it's a workaround. They know it's easier to move money in the shadows without safeguards like know your customer rules or suspicious transaction reporting. These common sense protections help identify illicit money and keep it out of our financial system. We must make sure that crypto platforms play by the same rules as other financial institutions. We need to make sure we have the tools crack to crack down on illicit finance with digital assets, just as we would with any other asset. Many, including the Deputy Secretary, have pointed out possible gaps in illicit finance authorities over di digital assets. It's time we work together to close these loopholes and protect our national security. We need to think not just about how terror groups and drug traffickers use crypto, but also about how they could exploit it tomorrow. If we leave loopholes in the books, this problem will get worse, and we simply can't take that risk. Given the range of threats we face, it's clear the administration needs to do more to use its illicit finance tools to stop terrorism, to push back on Iran and Russia and China, to stop the funding streams of the traffickers supplying illicit fentanyl to our children and our communities. I look forward to hearing from the Deputy Secretary this morning. Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Secretary. Thank you for being here with us this morning. Today is an important opportunity to discuss American leadership, especially on the global stage. I've often said that we, the United States, must leverage our international toolkit to stop bad actors, curb illicit activity, and protect American families. Thankfully, agencies like the Treasury Department already have robust toolkits available, as well as in instances where additional direction is needed. I have not shied away from providing more resources and direction, like those in my Fend Off Fentanyl legislation and my Revoke Iranian Funding Act as well. So I appreciate having you here with us this morning. South Carolina is a proud home to many of our U.S. service members, their families, and our veterans. I'm proud of this fact and my important duty to serve their interests, which is why it was particularly profound and deeply troubling when three U.S. service members were killed in January's Iranian-backed terror attack. I will keep saying this because it's true. Every dollar this administration gives to Iran is another dollar that will be used against our sons and daughters and puts them in harm's way in the military. Thankfully, the Treasury Department has the ability to stop the dollars moving around our global economy that bolsters the Iranian regime. However, this White House has reduced those barriers through so-called electricity waivers with expanded currency access to euros, licenses, and further billion-dollar payouts, going even so far as to give a lifeline to Nicolas Maduro's corrupt regime in Venezuela, a known ally of Iran, China, Russia, and Cuba, an axis of terror through broad oil and gas sanctions relief, of which we have seen no benefit to U.S. national security or to the Venezuelan people who suffer under Maduro. This is beyond troubling, especially when our service members are killed in terror attacks by Iranian proxies and our families here at home are struggling to put food on the table. When we look, at, when we look here at home, there's not a single neighborhood, whether that's Charleston, South Carolina, or Cleveland, Ohio, that has escaped the death grip of fentanyl. I'm very proud of this committee's work to address this crisis and for the support of all the members of this committee working together to stop this deadly drug. Because what fentanyl produced and trafficked by Mexican cartels and supported through Chinese precursors has done to our communities is a national security crisis. I remain committed to seeing this legislation passed into law and to stop the flow of illicit money and drugs across our border. Every family in America deserves to be free from the scourge of this deadly drug. I started with these two issues because I believe they should be top of mind for this administration and for this committee. And yet, just last week, 
Secretary Yellen was in China to discuss how cheap Chinese exports of green energy technology are harming electric vehicles and solar energy here in the United States. This is a clear climate goal of the, this administration, but far from the top goal we should be pushing back China on. A perspective that's frankly hard to stomach when Hamas is enabled by support from Iran to carry out horrific attacks against our ally, Israel. All while China continues to be the top purchaser of Iranian oil and top financier to international web of illicit financing used by the Mexican cartels to kill people using fentanyl. This needs to stop. Saving lives cannot play second fiddle to progressive climate goals. We need to see real efforts by China to stop these activities that undermine U.S. national security interest. America must be a strong leader. Fentanyl and terrorism are leading threats and should be treated as such. American families deserve to know that their government is protecting them from these threats and punishing those who trouble us. Thank you. Thank you for holding this hearing. I look forward to the opportunity to question uh, thank you, Senator Scott. I'll introduce today's witness, the Honorable Wale Adeyemo, as Deputy Secretary of Treasury, held a range of senior economic and national security positions. He briefed this committee on the immediate aftermath of the tragedy of the October 7th attacks. Welcome back. Please proceed. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Scott, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today. I want to thank you and the members of the committee for your willingness to work with us to address the threats to our national security. I'm here today because we need additional tools to protect the American people. And I appreciate the fact that this committee has not shied away from providing us with tools in the past, and I look forward to working with you to make sure that we have the tools that are necessary going forward. As we take steps to cut terrorist groups and other malign actors off from the traditional financial system, we are increasingly concerned about the ways these actors are using cryptocurrencies to circumvent our sanctions. For example, Years ago, al-Qaeda and affiliated terrorist groups largely based out of Syria operated a Bitcoin money laundering network using social media platforms to solicit cryptocurrency donations. After receiving virtual currency, they laundered the proceeds through various online gift card exchanges to be able to purchase what they needed to advance their violent agenda. Most recently, over the past year, we have seen the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Quds Force transfer cryptocurrency to Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. In addition, we have seen Hamas use virtual currencies to solicit small dollar donations, and we've been able to take actions against these networks. Our problem is that actors are increasingly finding ways to hide their identities and move resources using virtual currency. What has always been true is that terrorists and other malign actors seek new ways to move their resources in light of the actions we're taking to cut them off from accessing the traditional financial system. For the most part, these methods have been slower and harder to use than the traditional financial system. That is no longer true. Today, because of the authorities Congress have provided us, we have a long track record of taking actions to make it harder for these groups to use the traditional financial system to move money. We continue to use these, aggress these authorities aggressively to cut off the illicit financial networks to enable illicit actors worldwide, including Hamas and other Iran-banked proxies, Russian oligarchs, ISIS, just to name a few. The more, but the more effective our targeting is, the more reasons there is for these terrorist groups and others to look to virtual assets. And to be clear, it's not just terrorist groups but state actors like the DPRK and Russia as well. The DPRK, which through numerous complex state-sponsored cyber heists is able to acquire, launder, and store illicit revenue. It relies on anonymity-enhancing technologies like mixers to hide the sources of these funds, and it leverages over-the-counter digital assets traders to acquire fiat currency. In addition, we've seen Russia increasingly turn to alternative payment mechanisms, including the stable coin Tether, to try to circumvent our sanctions and continue to finance its war machine. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Ranking Member, you both mentioned fentanyl, which is 
killing too many Americans around this country. What we know to be true is that these drug cartels are increasingly looking for ways to move money that are outside the traditional financial system. Just a few weeks ago, I was in uh, Phoenix, where together with law enforcement, we sanctioned 21 actors who were trying to move financial resources back to Mexico. As we take steps to shut these actors out of our financial system, we should know that they are going to increasingly look to use cryptocurrencies and virtual assets to move things, given our lack of ability to stop them, given the lack of tools. While we're doing everything we can and we'll continue to use the tools we have given you, you have given us, the reason that I sent the term sheet uh, in November was because of what we saw, which was that today, while Treasury has tools that Congress has given us that we're using to go after terrorist actors and other illicit actors, we need new tools. The term sheet calls for three things. First is the introduction of a secondary sanctions tool targeted at foreign digital asset providers that facilitate illicit finance. The second is, re is a reform centered on modernizing and closing gaps in existing authorities by expanding their reach to explicitly cover the key players and core activities of the digital asset ecosystem. Finally, a third reform addresses jurisdictional risk from offshore cryptocurrency platforms, which is a key challenge that we face today. There is clear overlap between the proposals that we have made and the bipartisan bills coming out of this committee. We agree that the use of these emerging technologies by illicit actors can have impacts on our national security, foreign policy, and, econ and the economy of the United States. That's why the United States has a strong interest in ensuring that we have the necessary tools and authorities available and ready to mitigate the risks in this quickly evolving ecosystem, including the dollar-based digital assets in particular. While we continue to assess the tariffs prefer the use of financial products and services, we fear that without congressional action to provide us with necessary tools, the use of virtual assets by these actors will only grow. That is why I look forward to our conversation today and working with this committee to develop the tools we need to protect our national security, protect our economy, and protect the United States of America. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for having me. I look forward to your questions. Mr. Uh, Deputy Secretary, many of us have raised the alarm about digital assets and illicit finance, particularly after Hamas, after Hamas's horrific October 7th attack. You wrote to this committee last November, you've referred to that, uh, warning about gaps in our illicit finance framework around digital assets. Uh, briefly, tell us about those potential gaps. What are the risks if Congress fails to act to prevent terrorists and drug trafficking drug traffickers from exploiting crypto. Senator, I think uh, I appreciate the ways in which the committee has met with us and worked with us here. The greatest risk we have today is that as we take actions, like the 55 sanctions we've placed on Hamas since October 7th, and we monitor their activities in the financial, in the formal financial system, they are clearly going to try and move to get money through the informal system, which includes cryptocurrency. While traditionally what groups like this have done is move money by hand and by courier, which is slower and harder to do. Cryptocurrency gives them a route that is easier to do and in lots of ways allows them to get faster access to these currencies. That's why we think it's essential that we get the tools that we have called for in this proposal and that many senators in this committee have sponsored legislation to give us. And obviously we want to work, continue to work with you on that. Uh, November last year, President Biden met with Chinese President Xi to talk about efforts to count, counter the fentanyl trade. Uh, Secretary Yellen just concluded a trip to China and President Biden and Xi spoke last week. Uh, we also know, as we've seen many times, Chinese pro China's promises don't mean much. What is the administration doing to hold China to any commitments and to take action if they fail to follow through and crack down on fentanyl precursor suppliers? This is an issue that is top of mind for us and top of mind for the Secretary in her conversations with her Chinese counterparts. We've made very clear to the Chinese that it's not in their interest for precursor drugs to be sold in the United States, but if they don't act, we will. And we are prepared to take actions against those precursor companies. Fundamentally, our goal here is to make sure that those precursors don't end up in places like Mexico and then turn into the drugs that are sold on our streets. Disrupting that network is top of mind for the conversations we're having with the Chinese, but we're also looking very closely at intelligence to see if they're taking the actions that they've promised to take. If they are so, not, so, so how do you show it's not in China's interest to do that? 
fundamentally, the Chinese also are not, the Chinese also want to control the illegal drug trade in China. They fundamentally don't want to be in a position where they are exposed to U.S. sanctions in light of the impact that potentially has on their economy. We've made very clear that as we look at the intelligence and information, if we find that those precursor chemicals are still coming to the United States, we're going to have to use our sanctions authorities to go after those companies and to disrupt that activity. We continue, we're, we're continuing to monitor that, that information, and I want to be very clear that our goal here is to make sure that we stop those precursors because stopping them is the best way to make sure that those drugs aren't produced that end up on our streets. And presumably the threat of fend off fentanyl, as Senator Scott and I and our staffs wrote, um, will, the, the threat of that encourages China to do the right thing here? It's quite helpful to have congressional action that you are thinking through that could be done here in light of the fact that it not only impacts um, foreign countries, but it impacts these criminal businesses. Because ultimately what they are are businesses. The problem is they're, inv they're engaged in an illegal business, and the more that they see that Congress is interested in giving us additional tools to go after them, it helps us better dissuade people from entering into this business and allows us to stop them um, where they stand and to make sure they don't have access to their money, which is, which is their ultimate goal. Uh, last question. Uh, are unprecedented sanctions on Russia have resolved in the equivalent of hundreds of millions of dollars in Russia's central bank reserves being frozen. Despite that, Russia continues to find ways to access things it needs to continue its brutal attack on the Ukrainian people, whether that's revenue generated by oil sales to China, India, drones, missiles from Iran and North Korea, goods transshipped through third parties. Uh, all of this made worse uh, from uh, cited by um, interesting comments that a congressman from Ohio, Mike Turner, a friend of mine, said that over the weekend. How do you plan to strengthen our sanctions and sanctions enforcement to counter that? One of the things that we have been the most successful at is building an uh, international coalition to hold Russia accountable. We have to do more with that coalition to go after both Russia's revenues, but also their ability to build weapons. Fundamentally, the thing that Russia is doing with the money they have is building the weapons they want. In order to build those weapons, they need to purchase certain goods from the outside world. Going after those goods, going after their supply chain has to be a key part of our strategy. We've put sanctions on that supply chain, and our goal is to make sure that as Russia adjusts to those sanctions, we do even more to make sure we're putting sand in the gears of Russia's military industrialized complex. But the thing that we know, Senator, is that we have the capacity to slow Russia down. One of the things that we are grateful for is the Senate's passage of the president's supplemental request, because that's going to allow us to give Ukraine access to the weapons they need to speed up in defending themselves. But we're going to continue to do what we can to make sure that we reduce Russia's revenues and reduce their ability to build weapons using our sanctions. It's key that we do this in a multilateral way, because what Russia has become adept at doing is trying to find ways to evade our sanctions by not using the U.S. dollar, but using the international system. And the more countries that are part of our coalition, the better as we go after Russia, both in terms of revenues and their supply chain. Thank you. I've run out of time. I, would, I was going to ask a question about terrorists and the use of dollar stable coins, but um, well, we'll do that in a written question, Senator Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let's listen to you today, Deputy Secretary. Uh, it feels like digital assets has become the scapegoat of this administration because with all that's going on in the world, the only legislative requests you have sent to this committee are new authorities related to cryptocurrency. And, and, and I will say that if China buys about 90% of the Iranian oil, and we make it easier to sell the Iranian oil, if in last August we saw a $6 billion transfer to the Iranians for, in my opinion, hostage relief, $10 billion allowing electricity waivers, none of that's happening in digital assets. They're literally using our cash. We're making it easier for them to use euros. The bottom line is this, that if $35 billion represents the export of oil from Iran, none of which is purchased using digital assets, having a conversation simply and exclusively about digital assets misses the elephant in the room that every single time we make it easier for the Iranian regime to receive resources from the United States in cash, pallets of cash, or through electricity waivers, use euros or license, we put more and more Americans and our allies in harm's way, and that includes Israel. 
Uh, and so for us to have a conversation that sounds like a digital asset conversation, as opposed to a conversation about illicit financing that is far larger than digital assets, to me, makes it into a scapegoat. I'd love to hear why the Treasury Department made it a determination to change the recent electricity waivers to allow for the use of euros. Was that a request from the Iranians? So, Senator, just to, um, for the record, that is an authority that the State Department has. But I think the most important thing to point out here is that on both the electricity waiver but also the $6 billion, both of those are monies that are tied up in financial institutions. None of that money will ever see its way to Iran. At most, that money can be used to purchase things outside of Iran. The challenge here is that while we can stop that money from financial institutions moving to Iran, I don't have the authorities to stop cryptocurrencies from moving into Iran. That's why I've asked for those authorities. Yeah. But fundamentally, what I can say is that well, six billion second, you mentioned. Second, let's, let's have a conversation about this for just a second. I, I, you, you are a highly educated, brilliant man. To sit here and to suggest that you don't understand us giving Iran $6 billion that they will be able to use at some point. And then, uh, then the administration said, they, they can't use it for this purpose, but they can use it for that purpose. Money's fungible. I mean, uh, you, don't, you don't have to be as educated as you are to know that money's fungible. So the bottom line is simply this. Anytime we allow the Iranians to have more access to cash, euros, balance sheets, we are making it easier for their proxies to use their resources to target Americans, as has been done for the last several months. In addition to that, our allies. A anytime we relax the regime that makes it harder for them to sell oil, making it easier for them to do so, with China happily purchasing those resources, we, we, we don't have to be that smart to realize that all of this makes it harder on our allies and deadly for our service members. So I just find it preposterous that we would posit a position that suggests that those resources have no impact on what Iran is doing. And frankly, if that were the case, we would not have released them at all. Senator, can I make a point? Please. Oh, yes, sir. So, Senator, you're right that in a democracy, money is fungible. But what we've seen time and ta time from the Iranian regime is they fail to feed their people and they put the IRGC first. Any dollar they have will go towards their violent activity before they deal with their people. That's partially why almost none of the humanitarian money has been used for humanitarian purposes, is they don't care about getting drugs and food for their people. But the difference is that the United States of America has made as a values proposition that we are always going to provide humanitarian relief for people. And that's what we've said is the only purpose for this money. So while in our country money is fungible, in Iran they've proven that any dollar they get that they have direct access to in the country will be used for the IRGC before it's ever used yeah. for their people. Well, Secretary, just because I'm not the chairman of this committee, and, and he is, he's going to cut me off as soon as I say something he doesn't like. So let me just suggest this. Uh, you and I actually agree on that point, that the Iranian regime does not care about the Iranian people. Therefore, any relaxation that allows their economy to thrive or survive is for one purpose, for them to carry out their primary objective, which is spreading terrorism throughout the Middle East and eliminating the little Satan and then the big Satan. That would be Israel and America. It's uh, Senator Menendez from New Jersey is recognized. Um, thank you. I'd like to follow up where Senator Scott just left off. Reports show uh, that in spite of U.S. sanctions, many of which I've written, Iran's exports of crude oil grew by roughly 50% in 2023 to a five-year high of almost 1.3 million barrels a day, with the vast majority of that oil going to China. And according to the Congressional Research Service, many of these exports are going to small and mid-sized refiners with little exposure to the U.S. financial system. So if Iran can consistently find willing buyers for its all oil in China, what does that do to the effectiveness of our sanctions? What are you doing to put pressure on Chinese entities 
that import Iranian oil despite U.S. sanctions? Senator, thank you for the question. I think what we've been focused on is taking actions to disrupt the ability of Iran to sell its oil anywhere by going after middlemen. So over the course of the last several years, we've put more than 300 sanctions on Iran related to its petrochemical industry. But in addition to doing that, one of the things we're also focused on is making sure that even if Iran is able to sell its oil to actors, it's hard to impossible for Iran to get that money and return it back to its country using the traditional financial system. So monitoring the flows of that money is another place where we've been very focused. So I'm going to well. join in Senator Scott and admire how intellectually gifted you are. But it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand that you can convert those dollars uh, into um, cryptocurrency and other forms in order to ultimately have access to them. So if we say that all of our sanctions are a success when their oil import, uh, exports grew by roughly 50%, 50%, uh, I, I just don't see how we can make that case. And I think part of the problem here is that we are reticent to actually sanction uh, China and Chinese actors as we try this new detente with them. So, Senator, I think you made one of the points that I came to make, which is that we need more authorities to go after cryptocurrency. I think that we are willing to, and we have sanctioned middlemen that are in Hong Kong and in other places. We'll continue to do that. But the challenge set that we have now is that while you've given us authorities to go after the traditional financial sector, we could use additional authorities to allow us to go after well, cryptocurrency. I look forward to working to, with others to try to make that happen. But uh, when it happens, then I hope we actually see it used, because I'm concerned that many of the existing authorities we have are not being fully used. Let me turn to something else. I'm concerned about the exploitation of our litigation finance industry by foreign actors. According to Bloomberg Law, Russian billionaires with ties to Putin have spent millions funding fed, uh, bankruptcy lawsuits in New York, even after these individuals were sanctioned following the invasion of Ukraine. Do you believe that lack of transparency in the litigation finance industry can create a gap in our sanctions enforcement? Completely agree with you that this is an issue that we have to look, we have to both work on and try and address. One of the challenges we have, of course, is that these Russian oligarchs have become quite expert in trying to avoid our sanctions. And um, what I, from what I've seen, this is one of the several ways in which they're trying to do that. Well, this is not only the concern with the current state of affairs. GAO found in a 2022 analysis that sovereign wealth funds may be investing in the United States third-party legal financing market to further foreign policy and military goals. And foreign companies via wealth funds can use this type of investing to fund lawsuits against their U.S. competitors, which is something we're increasingly seeing in patent litigation. What can we do to show up regulation of litigation financing to ensure it isn't a pathway for bad actors to exploit the legal system? I think one of the most important things we can do, Senator, which I know you've called for, is additional transparency. Better understanding who's funding what will help us better be able to both use our tools, but also to make sure the American people are aware of who's funding these lawsuits. Well, uh, I would like to, do you, do you think you need legislation for that, or do you think you have uh, executive authorities to do that? I'd like to work with you and go back to my team and talk okay. to them about what we have, but if we need legislation, we will quickly come to you to ask for that. Fair enough. Uh, I think we can all agree that more work needs to be done to update and clarify our digital asset regulatory regime. However, that does not and should not exempt service providers from complying with existing laws. According to the most recent National Money Laundering Risk Assessment, quote, some virtual asset service providers currently do not adequately implement AML CFT controls or other processes to identify customers. And in some cases, such VAS may claim not to be subject to U.S. jurisdiction despite doing business wholly or substantially part of the United States. While Congress works on an updated digital asset framework, what is Treasury doing to step up enforcement of existing law? Are there any additional resources you require? We appreciate what you and members of this committee are doing to help up date both the BSA but also IEPA in order to give, make sure that we're clear to members of the digital asset ecosystem that they are subject to um, both of those regimes. While Congress does that, we're also using the tools you've already given us. For example, the 311, which we used recently to go after a class of digital assets called mixers, which are used, frankly, to 
try and help people disguise their identity using cryptocurrencies. We've also taken a number of actions to go after the ways in which Hamas has used cryptocurrencies as part of the 57 actions we've taken against Hamas. So we're committed to continue to take on this problem set, um, including with the action we've taken against Binance. But we appreciate the fact that Congress is working to give us additional authorities and tools to allow us to do this. I look forward to working with you on several of these issues. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator uh, Kennedy from Louisiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Secretary, um, the, the Biden administration has operated as Iran's best friend, hasn't it? No, I disagree completely, Senator. Well, um, Iran sold Iraq $10 bi billion, not million, $10 billion worth of electricity, but Iraq couldn't pay them because of our sanctions against, against Iran. Biden administration waived those sanctions, didn't it? Senator, that so that so that, that Iran could get ten billion dollars. Isn't that a fact? No, Senator. Those those waivers started under the Trump administration. That money is still in Iraq. That money has never been to Tehran. It will never go to Tehran. The first waiver was on July two thousand and twenty-three, wasn't it? Senator, I believe those waivers started in twenty eighteen. The, the, the first waiver that the Biden administration did was July of 2023, wasn't it? So, Senator, again, I believe the waiver program started in... You didn't, you, didn't do a, you didn't issue a waiver on July of 2023? Senator, the waivers were continued into 2023. And you issued another waiver to uh, get the money to Iran in November of 2023, didn't you? Senator, as I said, that money has never been, will never go to Iran. The money is still in Iraq. The money may be used for humanitarian purposes, but not a dollar of that money. And you, and you issued another waiver on March of 2024, not too long ago. That was six weeks after Iran killed three American soldiers. Senator, you gave Iraq permission to give Iran $10 billion, didn't you? No, Senator. As I mentioned, this was something that started in 2018 under the Trump administration. It allowed Iraq to purchase electricity and to store that money in, in Iraq. None of that money to date will ever go to Iran. The money is being held for humanitarian purposes. You're not telling the truth, Mr. Secretary. No disrespect, but that's just not true. Senator Menendez and Senator Scott made the point. We all know. Unless you peaked in high school, you know that money is fungible. Um, you also, the Biden administration also um, paid Iran $6 billion to release five of our, our prisoners, didn't it? Senator, again, that money is in Qatar. None of that money has been used. It hasn't been moved. And as I said earlier, while money is fungible in the United States because we care about our people, it's not fungible for the Iranian So the money's in Qatar? In a bank in Qatar? Yes. Now, what, what, what do you think, who controls that bank in, in, in Qatar? Those banks are, connect, are controlled by those individuals who run that financial institution. I see. So, so if, if uh, President Biden says, Qatar Bank, don't give this money to Iran, and the Qatar government says, give the money to Iran, who do you think the Qatar Bank's going to listen to, Mr. Secretary? So, Senator, those banks in Qatar value greatly their ability to have a relationship right. with the United States because right. that's how they make money. You believe ultimately, in the tooth fairy? We, ultimately, if we cut off those banks, they will no longer be able to make money. Do so, you believe in the Easter Bunny? So, Senator, while I understand your point, fundamentally, none of that money has gone to Iran, and that money is not going to go directly to Iran. Now, you did the same thing with Maduro, you meaning the Biden administration. You guys did the same thing with Maduro in Venezuela. You removed all the sanctions on oil and mining, including gold, with Maduro, the dictator of Venezuela, didn't you? So GL 44 and 43 were put in place in Venezuela. 43 has already- Is that a yes? GL 43 has been removed. So you, so you said, okay, Maduro, we're gonna remove, remove Maduro, best friends with Iran and Cuba and China and Russia. You, the Biden administration removed the sanctions 
on oil and, and mining in Venezuela. Senator. And, and the, the uh, Maduro said, I promise you that I'll hold a free and fair election. And then he put all his opponents in jail. And the Biden administration has done nothing, hasn't it, except stand there sucking on its teeth. So, Senator, I want to say again, we provided general licenses. We did not remove the sanctions. The reason we did that was because we did not trust. So what we can do the is... The sanctions on Maduro's oil are not there, are they? General license 44, which gives permission for the sale of oil, expires on April 17th, which will then put those sanctions back in place. We did not remove the sanctions. The, we the, 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 the problem you folks have is that you want to so quote Socrates in the middle of a bar fight. Iran is not our friend. Venezuela is not our friend. President Biden keeps giving them money to buy weapons to try to kill us. Senator, we Do you not understand that? sanctions on the Iranian regime. We have not allowed a dollar from Qatar or from the Iraqi electricity fund to flow to Iran. We That's just not true. Senator Menendez explained that to you. The money How can you be that obtuse? Senator, as I've said, our goal is to make sure that we take every action to prevent Iran's destabilizing activity in the region. We're going to continue to go after Iran's sale of oil and try and limit their ability as best we can using the tools that you've given us. I'm here before the Senate asking for additional tools that will allow us to continue to do that. Okay, you saw Senator Kennedy made your point. Senator Warner from Virginia is recognized. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Deputy Secretary, I've, I've enjoyed working with you for a long time. I'm, I'm a little unclear. I just want to make sure, and you know, for the record, what are the circumstance in Qatar or Iraq? Iraq, I know, for, for example, of being able to purchase additional electricity. Any of those dollars go to Iran? No, none of those dollars have went to Iran. None of those dollars will go to Iran. No ands, ifs, buts, no secret passageways, no other kind of things that may have been alluded to. Are any of those U.S. dollars going to Iran? No, those are not U.S. dollars. Those dollars. Uh, those are dollars that were. That money will. That, not be, they were that dollar denominated that yes. were owned by these other nation states. Yeah. But even those assets owned by these other nation states that happen to be de denominated in dollars. Through any of your, the, the Trump administration's actions, are any of those dollars ending no. up? No, and they will never flow to Iran. They will never go directly to Iran. Okay. No magic doors. Thank you. Um, one of the, I do want to talk about what you um, are up here on, because I do think we, um, we need some additional tools. And one of the things I say to my colleagues, you know, we, back in 2016, we put in place legislation to go in terms of secondary sanctions on on Hama, uh, on I'm sorry, Hezbollah. Um, since that time, we've seen uh, new ways to move assets around, uh, crypto being one, um, banking systems finding ways around sanctions. That's why you know, I put together legislation with uh, Senator Reid and Senator Rounds, Senator Romney, called the Special Measures to Flight Modern Threats Act. Subsequently, I introduced uh, the Kansi Act to help to uh, deal with ev um, efforts to evade sanctions using DeFi. Um, the truth of the matter is, you know, for all of the angst and anger and, and uh, concern, there's something we could do in a bipartisan way that would be really simple. And I still can't completely understand. I, I've, I've talked to them my Republican colleagues, who I think or agreement with me that say the same kind of legislation we put in place to go after Hezbollah, shouldn't we put that kind of legislation with those additional tools in place to go after Hamas? Completely agree with you, Senator, and I think we've been um, happy to work with you and the bipartisan members who are interested in working on this legislation. And our bill expands coverage to foreign financial entities that facilitate transactions for any terrorist group. Again, that whole notion of secondary sanctions so that we can um, clear up and make sure that no matter what talking points you're talking to, you can answer a question straightly that, you know, we are going to go after Hamas and any of their secondary funders, no matter what form of currency or fiat they use. Um, 
And I know you've been trying to uh, uh, do this with executive order, but I think as you've repeatedly said, you need additional tools. We do, um, and we appreciate the work that you're doing on this tool because we think it would be useful for us and something where we'd be prepared. To if we were to have those additional tools, describe specifically what would be a, what what you could do in terms of limiting Hamas's access to funds, regardless of their source around the world. Fundamentally, one of the problems set today is that while we take actions to make it harder and harder for Hamas to move money through the traditional financial system, what they're attempting to do is to use everything from individuals to curry cash to cryptocurrency to move money into Gaza. It's hard to move money by people given what's happened, what's going on with the border, but cryptocurrency is far easier. Having a secondary sanctions tool will mean that when we take an action, it will pause other actors from touching the nodes in the cryptocurrency ecosystem that are potentially helping Hamas to move their financial resources and will make it harder for them to move them and potentially even stop their movement in the place where they exist at the moment. Well, one of the things that I was proud to work with the chairman on and, and uh, the former ranking member, Senator Crapo, where we tried to significantly advance AML, KYC, you know, kind of the how we figure out who people are doing business with and where the bad guys are. Um, I personally believe that uh, you know, if we're looking at the Office of Terror, uh, Terrorism and Financial in Independence or OFAC or FinCEN, you know, these entities, even looking back years ago, are under enormous strain. As we try to track down bad guys' sources of funds, particularly in an increasingly complex financial world, um, do these entities, we all agree we don't want to go after the bad guys, but do these entities need additional resources if we're going to give you these additional tools? They do, Senator. Ultimately, what we know is that these actors are well-funded and looking to move their money as quickly as possible, making sure that the talented men and women who work on these issues have the resources they need to go after this problem set is critically important, especially given that from Russia to Hamas, the thing that they are looking for is access to money. We need the money to hire talented men and women and to pay for the technology that's necessary to track their funds and shut them down. Well, again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, again, appreciate the, the witness's willingness to restate, again, for the record, um, that these dollars or, or these resources that were owned by other nation states that happened to be delineated in dollars, uh, that whatever sanctions relief that was granted did not end up with those resources flowing into Tehran, regardless of how much um, some of my colleagues may say otherwise. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Senator Tillis of North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you uh, for being here. I I uh, actually, I want to start just by saying, I think some of the frustration you're going to hear, uh, we could go back and forth on whether or not licensing is, in fact, uh, allowing flow of resources. There's an underlying uh, frustration with the, uh, actually, I think, with the Obama administration and, and the Biden administration on money that has indisputably, uh, indisputably gone to Iran and, and uh, in connection with the JCPOA. We're very frustrated by that because we see them as a malign actor that's making the world less safe and certainly destabilizing Middle East. So um, I, I admire your poise, although I may disagree with a few of your answers. I'm not gonna go down that path. I, I want to talk more broadly in the, in the uh, classified briefing. Uh, I mentioned that we wanted to get a punch list of things that we could work on around illicit finance and particularly using digital assets to move money around you provided a, a, a document to us, and at least a couple of provisions have been instructed in a, in a discussion draft that we put out this week called the Enforce Act that I'd like to get with the department and see if uh, we can address any concerns that you have. For my, for my colleagues, what we're trying to do is provide uh, something that I believe that can be implemented that is also instructed by the reality of a distributed ledger. Um, I believe some of the uh, K, the Know Your Customer, the, the BSA, AML uh, reporting provisions that even the department are considering do not work in a distributed ledger environment. Um, and so what we're trying to do is propose something that we believe is a good tool um, and that will not regulate us out of being a viable player in the digital asset or crypto space. Uh, the thing that we have to recognize here, I, I, I hear it all the time with some of my friends on the other side of the aisle that want more regulations for traditional bankers, at some point we make the United States less attractive for certain enterprises to be based, and, and crypto is probably, and digital assets generally, 
are likely one of the most mobile enterprises that can simply go somewhere else if our reporting requirements become too burdensome. So we need a light, lean um, regimen, I think, to make this work. Now to the crypto folks, uh, some of them in the Enforce Act, and I would like to, uh, to get your read on it, I, I think that, uh, that it's a good first step um, and, and hopefully we will be able to uh, get uh, Senator Haggerty um, co-introduce the discussion draft with me this week. We can at least have that as a first step. The one thing I would tell people in the crypto or digital asset space that's saying, you know, nothing to see here, everything's fine, they're wrong. There needs to be some light regulatory regimen put into place. Otherwise, there are risks. Think FTX, think a lot of other issues out there that we want to adjust for. We want to create the most hospitable environment for digital assets to thrive. We don't want to overreach and lose the opportunity to be that, uh, that uh, jurisdiction. Um, and so, uh, do you again, do you, do, do you acknowledge the inherent problems with uh, trying to imply the old uh, sort of banking construct of BSA, AML, and know your customer to uh, a distributed ledger, digital assets? So, Senator, I do think that, to your point, we have to take a differentiated approach depending on the type of tool. And that's why we would use this, um, even under our proposal, in a risk-based manner. And I, to your point of trying to make the, Ameri the United States a uh, jurisdiction that is able to win, um, even in this space, I think one of the proposals we have in our proposal is giving us the ability to... How do you to calculate the risk base? So that, that's a way of saying, I'm going to put my foot on the accelerator or not based on uh, someone in Treasury's assessment of the risk a given entity represents. Is that is that what you're suggesting? How does that give me any certainty, uh, you know, if I'm in this space? Because it seems like to me that could... Uh, that could differ from an administration that listens to Tom Tillis on financial regulations versus an administration that listens to Elizabeth Warren on financial regulations. She's a friend and colleague of mine. We have differences in terms of uh, the role government should play or just how far uh, down they should go. So it sounds like to me that could ebb and flow and not necessarily provide certainty that provides the sort of uh, fertile ground for us being able to define the gold standard of digital assets and crypto regulations. So, Senator, the one thing that I think we've all seen is that as the crypto ecosystem evolves and it evolves quickly, we're going to need to think about the regulatory approach as that evolution takes place. The goal here is to use the regulatory process to do this. And part of the one of the things that the regulatory process yeah. provides to these companies is a bit of certainty because there's a notice and comment piece of this where those That's, companies have the ability to provide feedback and that once those rules are in place, what we found- What kind of time frame? My, my time's up. I don't want to go too far over. I did have a, a closing comment for you, Mr. Chair, if I may, but um, what kind of time frame are we talking about uh, uh, through notice and comment before you promulgate a rule? So, Senator, the, um, it all depends on how complicated yeah, it is, but it could be as quickly as a year before okay. you have a full, you go through a- yep. So I guess the question that I have, uh, the, the, we've got an election coming up. There may be a change of administration. If there is a change of administration, there will be a vastly different view about how you go and regulate in this space. And so I, for one, would like to look at, uh, at the possibility of working with your office to address some of the things in your punch list that we agree with so that we may be able to get regulations on the books in this Congress that will certainly not go as far as some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle want to go but far short of the wild, wild west that we find ourselves in now. I look um, forward to working with you on that. And Mr. Chair, the only other thing I was going to suggest, I know that we're talking about maybe this being illicit finance and, uh, and terrorism, but uh, Senator Warren and I have talked about the broader issue. Cartels now, it's passe to launder the old way. Cartels use digital uh, and crypto platforms to launder at scale, and by scale, I mean in the billions. I think it'd be very helpful. I got a briefing about a year and a half ago from DEA. I mentioned this to Senator Warren before. I think it'd be very helpful to have a joint classified briefing to have Treasury and DEA in the room and see how we can, if, if we get right here and we implement a good regulatory regimen, we're gonna put uh, cartels, uh, criminal or transnational criminal organizations and terrorist organizations in a much more difficult position to move cash around because now they're doing it really without any obstacles whatsoever. Thank you. Uh, Senator Warren of Massachusetts is recognized.
Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It's good to see you, Deputy Adiemo. And thank you, Senator Tillis. I just want to follow up in the same area. And if I can, I want to lay a little background here. In November, after reports that Hamas had received millions of dollars in crypto funding in the months before its terrorist attack on Israel, Treasury wrote a letter requesting Congress's help in closing the gaps in our anti-money laundering rule. Deputy Adeyemo, can you explain why you sent us this letter? What were you seeing that caused you to send us this letter asking for us to change the law? Senator, as I spoke to my team about increasingly targeting Hamas's financial network, what I was seeing was the fact that as we went after their traditional financial resources and banks, that they were going to turn to other means of financing that could frankly even be faster and harder for us to track in cryptocurrency. And yesterday, um, I had an opportunity to sit down with the families of Americans who are being held hostage by Hamas today. And they asked me, what, if anything, can we do to cut off their finances? And I explained to them the actions we're taking in the traditional financial sector, but told them, frankly, that one of the places where we need additional tools is to be able to make sure that we don't allow Hamas to build up assets in the digital ecosystem using virtual currencies that are hard for us to track, because that is money that they will use to continue to come after uh, not only Israel, but, every, but also to destabilize the region. So how is it right now that Hamas has access to money or, or some form They're of, of financing for themselves? They are um, increasingly, in my view, turning to alternative means of financing, given what we've done in terms of their ability to do the traditional financial system. So, that, so what does that mean, alternative means of financing? One of those is cryptocurrency. And cryptocurrency is a means that uh, while we're using every tool we have, we need additional tools to go after. OK. And it's, it's not just Hamas and terrorists that are using crypto financing. North Korea, ransomware gangs, drug traffickers, distributors of child sexual abuse materials. Name your bad guy. And crypto is the way that they can move money around. Now, your letter that you sent to Congress follows a basic principle. Activities with similar functions and similar risks should follow similar rules. So I want to look at an example of that. I want to look at one of the middlemen examples, validators. So validators are the middlemen between the payor and the receiver, and they help process crypto transactions. In the traditional banking world, if a bank transacts with somebody who's laundering money, then they are break breaking the law. But validators in the crypto world don't have that same set of rules. Are there crypto validators right now that are processing transactions for North Korea and pocketing a fee for each of those transactions? There's same for Hamas, same for drug lords and child traffickers. There's reporting that I am familiar with that's public about the fact that those threat actors that you've mentioned are conducting that type of activity. OK, so bad guys can use crypto right now because we don't have the right rules to keep them out. But I think it's worse than that. We know, for example, that Iran, one of Hamas's biggest funders, makes millions of dollars validating transactions for others that have no connection to Hamas or Iran. So if I wanted to send $1,000 worth of crypto to you, Mr. Secretary, is it possible that when I just send it, just uh, to send this, that Iran could be our validator and would be collecting a fee processing our crypto, all of that without either one of us knowing it? So under a transaction like that is certainly possible. OK, so Iran, which is subject to all kinds of sanctions, is moving money through crypto and actually making millions of dollars validating crypto transactions for Americans and for everyone else, all because we don't have the right anti-money laundering rules in place. One more quick question. If the crypto market grows and the number of crypto transactions increases, does that mean more money would likely end up in Iran's pockets? 
everything that we've seen says that when markets grow, threat actors use them more, and we should expect that that is what would happen here as well. Okay, and more activity, more money. You know, currently the House is working on a bill to create a regulatory framework for stable coins. Stable coins make it easier to convert dollars into crypto and crypto into dollars. So they are an on-ramp into the crypto world. If we're going to create new on-ramps, increasing traffic, which is exactly what the House bill does, then we need a regulatory framework that will put the rules for anti-money laundering in place so that we do not have more opportunities for Iran and terrorists and drug lords and human traffickers to make more money. We've got to get those AML rules in place. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Senator Vance from Ohio is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thanks to um, Deputy Secretary for being here. Um, I want to ask just a couple of questions about our sanctions regime and potentially, you know, efforts within this body to really ramp up that, that sanctions regime. So um, you and I, I believe, discussed <coughs> last year, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, how the sanctions on Russia after Putin's invasion of Ukraine, what effect they were having on the Russian economy, what effects actually matched our expectations and what effects didn't match our expectations. Uh, you know, we're, we're a little further down the road here. Uh, it's April of 2024. Do, do we have a good sense of how the Russian economy did in 2023 and how effective the sanctions were or were not at inhibiting Russian growth? We have a better sense now than we did um, earlier this year. And to answer your question, Senator, I think what we have found is that the Russian economy has largely transitioned to a war economy, where all the tools of production have went from building out a diversified economy that was styled for long-term growth to one that is driven by a short-term need to build as many weapons as possible to further their war aims in Ukraine. And what did their GDP grow last year? Do you know? Their GDP, I believe, grew somewhere in the neighborhood of 1% to 2%. Okay. Uh, which is, you know, frankly, at or above some of our European allies. And uh, I, I, I really do worry here, and, and I agree with you, that they've transitioned their economy to a war footing. That has its own internal momentum. And one of the things I worry, I know this isn't your area um, of focus, one of the things I worry some of my, my colleagues underappreciate is that that war footing has a certain momentum to it. And we should be trying to arrest that war footing as much as possible, not leaning into it and prolonging this thing. Because I worry that once Russia becomes an economy that only works in a time of war, that actually makes it more likely and um, that they're going to uh, show aggression now and in the future. Um, I, I want to sort of transition in, 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 Mr. Secretary, how aware are you of sort of, of the Repo Act, R-E-P-O, that's sort of moving through uh, this chamber, are you sort of aware broadly with its outline? Yes, I am. Okay. So one of the things that that does, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, because I'm trying to sort of think through uh, my own view on it, but one of the really worrying provisions uh, is that, as I understand it, it would actually freeze the current sanctions regime that we have on Russia in place legally as an act of Congress. And so if a future president or a second Biden term wanted to change that sanctions regime, they would need an act of Congress to do so. Is that correct? I'm not certain of that provision. My understanding is that it gives the president certain authorities. I don't know that it freezes the current regime. Okay. Uh, that's that's my understanding, at least, but I think worth having a follow-up conversation, and certainly my staff will follow up as well on that particular topic. Uh, here, here's the thing that I worry about. I imagine that we have different preferences for who wins the next presidential election, uh, Mr. Secretary. But whether it's a President Biden or a President Trump, I think it's really important for the next administration to have diplomatic flexibility to negotiate what will certainly, I think, be an end to the Russia-Ukraine war, whatever end that ultimately takes. I hope to God that it doesn't last another five years. And what I worry about with the Repo Act is that we actually, if we are freezing the sanctions regime, we prevent the president from having an important tool at his disposal and actually negotiating a peaceful settlement to that conflict. Uh, let me let me ask just one final question on the Repo Act. Uh, as I understand it, it would give um, it, it, it it would effectively force asset seizure uh, of all Russian assets. And I, I'm wondering, you know, ha, ha, have we done that in a time of peace with a country that we're not directly at war with? Have we ever done something like what the Repo Act envisions? So, Senator. 
the one thing I am clear of is that my understanding, at least as the Senate version of the Repo Act, gives the president the ability to, doesn't require him sure. to do so. And I think part of the reason for that is because we know that the vast majority of those assets are in Europe, and we'd only want to act alongside our European allies if we did something like that. In terms of um, seizing the assets um, against a country that we're not um, engaged in hostility against, I don't know that we have done something like that at this point. Um, at this juncture in, um, at this juncture. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate that, Mr. Secretary. Uh, and with that, I, I yield the remainder of my time. Thanks for being here and thanks for answering my questions. Thank Thanks. You. Uh, Senator Warnock of George is recognized. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brown. The, the United States has become increasingly reliant on sanctions as a foreign policy tool over the past 20 years. Uh, I remain concerned that untargeted sanctions may only harm the poorest of the poor throughout the world. Oftentimes, economic sanctions, uh, as well-intentioned as they may be, are not felt by the governing class, the people who are actually making the decisions. Instead, they're felt by the poor and the meek, those with little say over the activities of those in power. They're literally caught in the crossfire. There's an old... Uh, African statement that when the elephants fight, the, the grass suffers. Uh, Deputy Secretary Adeyemo, uh, shortly after you took office in 2021, you led a broad review of the sanctions administered and enforced by the Treasury Department. What were the review's findings regarding how we can best ensure that our sanctions have the intended effect and deter bad behavior? So, Senator, I appreciate you asking this question because I think it is an issue that we don't speak enough about, which is that we need to make sure that our sanctions are targeted towards the threat actors and that we do as much as possible to reduce the harm against um, innocent individuals. That's why one of the findings of the sanctions review was the need to have very clear humanitarian carve-outs for the vast majority of our sanctions programs. But in addition to that, we needed to make sure that these sanctions are tied to a clear foreign policy objective, and that two, they are narrowly targeted in order to make sure that we have an impact on the threat actor, but not on the overall population. I think the findings of that sanctions review has influenced what we've done with regard to Russia and continues to influence the way we think about using sanctions going forward. Thank you so much. It's, it's so important that uh, the sanctions uh, do what they're actually intended to do and that we don't create uh, needless harm on suffering and innocent people who are already uh, marginalized. Um, speaking of humanitarian aid, and you talked about these humanitarian carve-outs as part of uh, your response given the findings of the study. As you know, Gaza is experiencing right now a humanitarian crisis uh, of unspeakable, uh, uh, at unspeakable levels. The trickle, the trickle of aid entering Gaza is not nearly enough not even close, to meet the needs of the Palestinian people. And the majority of Palestinians in Gaza are at severe risk of famine. We must ensure that U.S. policy is not standing in the way of providing urgent humanitarian assistance to Palestinian civilians, particularly the children. And at the same time, there is a real risk of terrorist groups like Hamas diverting aid for its own benefit. That's why I was glad to see Treasury issue guidance on providing humanitarian assistance to the Palestinian people without inadvertently financing Hamas very shortly after October 7th. Deputy Secretary uh, Adeyemo, uh, can you uh, update us on the implementation of this guidance uh, regarding issuance of general licenses and regarding oversight? So, Senator, one of the thing, the early things we did after Hamas's brutal attack on Israel was take actions to go after Hamas's finances. But we also sat down with financial institutions and humanitarian groups to make sure that they had the ability to continue to provide legitimate aid and financial assistance in uh, Gaza. One of the things that we learned at that point was the challenge wasn't U.S. sanctions given our humanitarian carve out, but were the sanctions put in place by some of our allies. Soon after, I traveled to Europe and with our European allies work with them to put in place a similar humanitarian carve out in their program in order to put us all in the same position where we could both target actions to go after Hamas, but to ensure that 
legitimate humanitarian assistance can flow through. Um, my goal and my team's goal is to continue to meet with financial institutions, but also with aid groups to ensure that our sanctions are in no way prohibiting the legitimate flow of financial resources and other resources into Gaza. Because to your point, I agree that not enough is being done, not enough is getting through, and we have to do everything in our power to make sure that we change that dynamic. So, so what, what needs to happen for the delivery of aid to be more effective? So, Senator, this is not primarily in my um, domain. The issues that are in my domain, though, are making sure that financial resources are able to flow. And the goal there has to be the continued engagement, not only of the United States government, but of the UK government and the EU government, the countries that are primarily putting sanctions in place with our financial institutions and with our humanitarian groups to ensure that they are not in any way being blocked in the delivery of legitimate humanitarian assistance. What I've heard from those groups to date is that the challenge they face is a fiscal one in terms of being able to get aid in, not a financial one. And But what I've also told them is the moment they feel as if in some way they have a financial block, I want them to call me immediately because our goal is to make sure that our sanctions are targeted towards Hamas, not towards um, impacting the innocent Palestinian people. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so very much. We have to work to ensure that there's rigorous oversight of aid to Palestinians, working also with our uh, European and other allies to both ensure that it actually provides assistance to those in need. Uh, and we want to certainly make uh, sure that uh, Hamas does not divert any sort of aid for its own purposes. Thank you so very much, Mr. Thank Secretary. You. Thanks, Senator Warnock. Uh, Senator Britt of Alabama is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will get right to it. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate the opportunity to have the conversation. Is there any doubt in your mind that the Iranian regime is the largest state sponsor of terrorism um, against the United States and our allies across the globe? None, Senator. None. So when we look at this, you know, I take a step back and kind of it is it's frustrating for me because I see um, this administration take a posture of, of appeasement. When I'm looking at it, you look from the decline of the strategy of maximum pressure under the previous administration to kind of where we are now. And I'm thinking if we all agree that that, that Iran is the largest state sponsor of terrorism, why wouldn't we be using you know, every tool in our toolbox to make sure that we prevent them um, from benefiting financially? And so we've seen Iran's oil profits soar um, since January 2021, reaching over 80 billion and counting, and its steel exports have actually increased twofold. So I guess my question is, has the Biden administration's enforcement authorities, have, have your sanctions enforcement authorities been limited at all since you've gotten to Treasury? No, Senator. We've put in place 571 sanctions against the Iranian regime, and I know that we've spoken personally about what's happening with steel, where we've, we've sanctioned the top steel producers in Iran, and the steel they're selling today is illicit and illegal. We have to do more and must do more okay. to cut off that illicit um, transaction, but those companies have been sanctioned by us. So let's talk about the steel specifically. What more do you think we could be doing? What tools do you need or um, could, could we use at a, at a greater level in order to crack down on that? So Senator, one of the things we have to do and that we are doing is working closely with the intelligence um, community to find out how they're illicitly selling uh, what is illegal steel at this point mm -hmm. to go after those nodes that are helping them to do that. So um, what you should expect is we're going to continue to take actions there. One of the reasons I'm here, though, is that um, you mentioned oil. And while Iran is selling oil, one of the challenges they're having is getting the money back to Iran, given mm -hmm. what we're doing in the financial sector. The thing that I am worried about is that Iran will increasingly turn from using the formal financial sector to move their assets and increasingly use cryptocurrency because we don't have well, tools. If there. you just look at where you are right here on, so if you look at, you know, we hit Iran's oil, you mentioned the oil exports receipt, they reached a, a five year high last year of 42 billion compared to, if you look at the 2020 numbers, 7.9 billion. What do you attribute to that, to that difference? One of the things that the Iranians are increasingly doing is they're consistently looking for ways to do everything from ship to ship transfers, using the gray fleet, using intermediaries to try and sell their oil. While we've put in place more than 500 sanctions against Iran, 
what we're finding is that the Iranian regime, given their desperate need for cash, is doing things to try and get around our sanctions. So we're going to continue to use our sanctions authorities, but ultimately um, that is going to continue to make it more costly for Iran to try and get around them, but they're going to continue to try. Are there any kind of given the data points of this past year and it being a high versus where we were in 2020, are there any tools in your toolbox that you're not using to the fullest extent possible? So, Senator, I think the thing that I've asked my team to do is to come back to me and talk about what else we can do. And I think the key for us is not only what the United States can do, but how do we build an international coalition, frankly, because one of the things that we benefited from in the past was that it wasn't just the United States acting, but we were acting alongside our allies and partners. And while today we've been able to get uh, in other countries to come alongside actions we've taken against UAVs when it comes to Iran and mm -hmm. some of their military components, we've been less successful in terms of going after their petrochemical industry. So I think part of this is a diplomatic effort to get other countries to join us in taking those actions because what Iran is doing is that they're moving their petrochemical industry into the shadows and they have and they're doing things that have fewer touch points with the U.S. dollar, which is a thing that I can use. So we need to get other. Are there loopholes specifically that they're that they're using with regards to Russia and China that um, that where we where we need to close those? So in terms of the petrochemical industry, they're actually a competitor to Russia because fundamentally they're selling the same thing on the market. So I think they are not working together in this space. I think from my standpoint, we're using the tools that you've given us to try and impact them using our dollar-based tools, but they're often trying to transact in ways using everything from funk companies to other currencies that require us to build a broader coalition. So last thing, I only have a few seconds left. Um, when you look at the switching gears um, at the Corporate Transparency Act for small businesses, what are you doing to ensure small businesses are aware of those new reporting requirements? One of the things I'm personally doing is speaking to small business interest groups and talking to them about what we can do to try and make sure that the small businesses they represent know about the act. And I think one of the things that we would appreciate is working with your offices so that we can go back to your district offices and do presentations about how small businesses can sign up. Fundamentally, what we know is that the vast majority of small businesses throughout our country want to do the right thing, will want to sign up. And by doing that, it allows us to find those um, illegitimate small businesses that are often creating threats. So I'm happy to work with your office to set up webinars in your district to send people down to your to your states to help make sure your small businesses are aware. But we're launching an all-out campaign to make sure that small businesses throughout the country are aware of um, the need to register. Excellent. I just want to make sure that they have that outreach. So look forward to working with you on that. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Cortez Masto of Nevada. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Deputy Secretary, it's good to see you. Good to see you as well. Thank you for being here. Last year, Treasury's Office of Foreign Asset Control brought sanc sanctions against several individuals and companies involved in the manufacturing and distribution of fentanyl, among other illicit drugs. In addition to sanctioning these individuals, OFAC identified several cryptocurrency addresses associated with these known traffickers. And OFAC's investigation shows a pervasive and deep interconnectedness of illicit drug trafficking and crypto. The addresses identified by OFAC collectively received just under $3.8 million worth of cryptocurrency. So my question to you is, do you think Treasury has the adequate tools and expertise to effectively combat the use of crypto in financing drug trafficking rings? And if you don't, what do you need? Senator, um Several months ago, Secretary Yellen set up a strike force to go after fentanyl because she sees the threat that it presents not only to American lives, but to um, our national security as well. And what we know is that these actors, these drug kingpins who are often just criminal business executives are going are increasingly moving to using crypto, as you mentioned. And the reason I'm here is because we need additional tools from you and the Senate to go after them. Those tools include the ability for us to, for example, go after cryptocurrencies or other parts of the crypto ecosystem that claim to be dollar backed, but to be trying to escape US jurisdiction, which makes it harder for us to go after them. We also need to update the definitions in our rules so they include the crypto ecosystem, so the Bank Secrecy Act and also IEPA. And finally, we would like to have a secondary sanctions regime that allows us to also 
make clear to traditional financial institutions that you should not engage with parts of the crypto ecosystem that are doing illicit transactions. Thank you. And would the Fend Off Fentanyl Act support your enforcement actions? Taking actions like that and taking actions that would provide us with additional authorities to go after fentanyl would be quite helpful. I think the challenge we have is that taking those actions in the traditional financial system will mean that more of these actors will likely turn to things like virtual currencies to try and escape us unless we update uh, and reform some of the rules that we have today for going after those actors. I'm interested also in learning about, and, and this is a new term um, because of crypto, but learning about uh, cryptocurrency mixers. Uh, and you talked a little bit about that, that help facilitate illicit financing. My understanding are that mixers are, are, are crypto platforms that enable users to exchange cryptocurrency anonymously by blending the cryptocurrencies of many users to obfuscate the origins and owners of the funds. And in 2022, almost 10% of all crypto addresses tied to illicit activity were laundered through mixers. So Deputy Secretary, can you explain a little bit about these mixers and the acute risk of bad actor, act, actors using them to engage in illicit finance? Senator, you, I think you um, made it very clear what they are. There are ways for people and for entities to hide their identity and to move money illicitly through the crypto ecosystem with the hope that they can turn that into hard currency at some other point and be able to get access to their ill-gotten gains. Uh, we've taken some actions against mixers, including using a 311 action to go after them. But my concern is that without the tools that we've requested from the Senate, we don't have the ability to go after these parts of the virtual currency ecosystem that uh, that are being used by threat actors, but may not be based or have US jurisdiction. That's why we think it's essential that we get these tools, because as we take steps to go after the traditional financial system, where we have a great deal of visibility where these threat actors exist, they're naturally going to turn to new tools like mixers to hide their identity. Absolutely, and that's why I appreciate uh, the need for the expanded tools of enforcement for areas like this and support it. Thank you. I do think it is so important we address um, the use of cryptocurrency uh, for money laundering and to engage in illicit activities for so many reasons. So thank you for being here again. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Cortez. Uh, Mr. Secretary, thank you for joining us, uh, for being here and providing testimony. Senators who wish to submit questions for the record those questions are due one week from today, Tuesday, April 16th. The witness will have 45 days to respond to those. Thank you again. Uh, the meeting's adjourned. Thank you, Senator.